and welcome to another edition of IDS Talks. My name is Hunter McMahon. I'm the COO at IDS, and I'm joined here today by Matt Peacock and Mick Loesch Orban. Tricky names today, tricky names, but uh, we talked about it beforehand. So today we're going to have a great talk about AI in the world of law. It's not really a linear progression. It's much more of a bigger concept, but we're going to at least introduce that. But before we introduce the topic, Matt, why don't you go ahead and give the audience a quick introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Hunter. So my name is Matt Peacock. I'm the managing partner of OMC Partners. Um, we're a niche firm of management consultants based in the UK, but operating globally. Uh, we've been in operation since 2006. And broadly, we're a, a mix of big four management consultants, former practicing lawyers such as myself. So I'm a litigator for my sins. Um, and essentially, we, we, we help lawyers deliver what they do uh, more effectively, more cost effectively, whether they're in-house or private practice. And obviously, technology is a, a key part of that equation. Absolutely. And everybody's talking about how AI can help us be more efficient. So, McLoosh, McLoosh, I knew I was going to do it one of these times. No worries. No worries. Hi. Um, hi and hello, everyone. Um, so, I'm Miklos Orban. I'm Hungarian. This is why I have this very you know, odd name. Um, odd, unique. I, I will, it, it's unique. Yeah, unique. yeah, it is unique. Yeah, it is unique. I love it. So um, I'm a legal, legal entrepreneur. Um, so I'm running a lot of businesses at the same time, which is a big challenge in my everyday life. But my most important role is probably I'm the CTO of Gonna Cook, which is um, a challenger law firm in the UK with offices not only in the UK, but also in the US and Germany and also in CEE. And I'm responsible for not only the legal tech um, of, of Gonna Cook, providing clients and, and, and the partners of Gonna Cook with legal tech solutions, but also the expansion of Gonna Cook in uh, Central Eastern Europe. Brilliant. So we, we've got an entrepreneur, we've got operations, we've got you know, efficiencies and and looking at the big picture. So what is AI really? I mean, McLoche, you, you're, you're a technology at heart, even though we've got a stack of books behind you. Is it really artificial? I, you know, I would rather focus on intelligence than, than the first word. Um, because what is intelligence? That's like the most important thing in the whole, in this whole um, debate. I think, I mean, everybody has, He's her own definition of intelligence. And my definition is basically the ability to predict. If you have only like a couple of things in your hand and you can already predict what's going to happen, then you're really intelligent. I think we misuse this um, word. We, we use it, we, we, we very often um, mix it up with being smart or clever which is not the same thing as being intelligent. Intelligent is that you only have like a couple of things and then you already know what's going to happen. Some people claim that it's more like you have the ability to summarize something that is very complicated. But I think, in my opinion, it is more like a prediction, the ability to predict very well uh, with a high success rate. And from that perspective, these models are really intelligent. I think we just have very often be used this word intelligence is from, with, with a completely different meaning. And then we're touching on different fields and different domains, like being clever, being emotional, being creative. That has nothing to do with intelligence. Intelligence is more about, I know that I'm not going to go cl too close to that animal because I know that there's like a high chance of it's going to beat me or something like that. That's intelligence or that that fall that that tree can fall on me because I can see that there is a crack on it, um, and and more complex things like this. So I think, I think the the intelligence side is very much in line with artificial intelligence. So I think it is intelligent. It is artificial, artificial in the sense that it is not natural, but it's built on you know human. We're trying to mimic basically the um, the human human brain one way or another. I mean, it's very artificial and very shallow because the uh, the way neural systems work um, is way more complicated and sophisticated than neural networks, artificial neural networks. But, but it still somehow tries to mimic the way we learn 
So I think it is actually not that bad how we use artificial intelligence, even though I think there is like a huge debate at the moment about we should use some some completely other um, expressions. I think it is still kind of describes what it is. Well, I think when you break it down that way and, and you focus on intelligence first, are you familiar with DIKW or data, information, knowledge, and then wisdom, the hierarchy of yeah. learning? And so yeah, yeah. red, the light is red, the stoplight is red. I should apply the brake so I don't run through the intersection kind of notion. And I think that that's your, your analysis of intelligence. But you're the first first to frame it up in, in the sense of artificial means non-human, not necessarily you know, some mythical creature, if you will. Um, but it's really just distinguishing whether or not it's coming from a brain or a computer. Yeah, but, but I don't think it's really mythical. If you, if it, if you ever tried building a, a model, there's nothing mythical about it. Even though I think if you listen to, I don't know, Sam Altman was running OpenAI, he claims that he doesn't really understand why this model, you know, ChatGPT works that well. And, and this is... Probably due to if you have like 300, 400 algorithms running at the same time, then you don't know which one is going to take over the other, why something, something works. If you ever try coding, even just a simple, simple game on any of the computer languages, you will realize that you don't, you, you, you're missing the point where you feel that you're, you're in full control. You, you're often feel really surprised that this is running and why this has not run before so it's i think yeah just because of the fact that um th this is this element and there are so many things going on at the same time within a computer not to mention that you know in very complicated very complex systems thousands of algorithms or even millions or tens of millions of algorithms running and within a you know fracture of a second then um it doesn't mean that we, we, we can't really capture this whole process and as a result, there has to be something mythical or even, you know, we, we keep telling about the, the black box effect, which is true that we have in neural network, the black box effect, even though I think that humans are, the human brain in itself is the biggest black box and not the computer. Um, well, but you, you distinguish something that it, it, it's a black box in the sense of an understanding, but not necessarily in the sense of access. So if, if you actually can dive into it and you have the time the energy and the patience, you can start to understand it. And, and maybe there are some elements that are hard for you to, you know, understand. But when we come to the world of law and, and Matt, you're often posed with the question of, well, how can I use this? There, there is a bit of a fear of black box, if you will. There's a bit of a fear of, OK, well, if I don't understand how it works, particularly in the legal world, how do I trust it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we are, as lawyers, we're evidence-led beasts, but we, we tend to be pretty good once we've been shown the evidence and shown that something works to actually get on board with it. So uh, a lot of the work that we do, for instance, is bluntly change management. It's about changing cultures, behaviours. It's about winning hearts and minds. So, uh, yeah, th there is certainly a, a, a well-trodden path already in terms of all of, you know, these types of change initiatives where you, know, you have to sort of start small, start with the low hanging fruit, build those use cases, shout about the benefits, um, you know, shout to clients about the benefits. And, and I like to think of lawyers as, as sort of meerkats that, you know, periodically someone will pop up, have a look around, see what somebody else is doing to great effect and go, oh, terrific. You know, there's something that I can do there. I could see how that would work with my practice. And then you build the momentum um, it, it, and these things all of a sudden um, are, are just, that's the way we've done things and it feels like we've done it forever. So I have, um, I have a longstanding client who heads up a global team of, of litigators uh, and she can remember things like email coming in, um, which seemed like such a radical. Just print thing it. Just print it all. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you know we've gone from uh, dictating on tapes to digital dictation to dictating through Word itself, uh, and all of these things seem so, I guess, novel and potentially scary, but are all 
now just embraced as part of the way we do things. So I, I do see the 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 advent, if you will, of generative AI as being part of this continuous cycle. But I think where it has been different is the speed uh, at which it has been, if not adopted, looked at. Um, and I think that's been driven really by a, a number of things. The, the first is by clients. Right. T typically, if something um, is done in the legal sector, it tends to be driven by clients and meeting client demands. So if you imagine a, an in-house legal team whose corporate colleagues in different functions are all getting to grips with yeah. AI, uh, chat GPT uses, um, you know, they, they will be expected to do the same. And I think there was a, a recent LexisNexis survey that said about 70% of in-house lawyers expect their law firms to be using this in the next 12 months. So you can see this direction of travel, which is in-house lawyers are using it, in-house lawyers are expecting it. Um, but more than that, I'm sure the first thing we all did when it was released we opened ourselves uh, an account. We started using it in our personal capacity. I, I don't know a lawyer out there who hasn't done that themselves in their own individual capability. Uh, and that, I think, is is radically different. So there's there's a an interest from the individual level. There's an interest from the client level. And obviously, the firms are interested in this. So it is. Really but I think that that's off. the yeah, yeah. I, I think the the collective interest and and I would argue the access to it. Right. So if, if you I, I would often say that this is not necessarily something new, but the accessibility of it is new. It's now available to anybody to sign up for a variety of platforms, a variety of engine uh, apps and engines and all that to be able to try it. And, and that curiosity, I love curiosity. That's what gets me in trouble half the time. Um, but it allows people to explore and get comfortable with it outside of the need for, I've got to perform a critical task for a client. And so I think we're lowering the barrier to entry for users. But as an entrepreneur, you're always convincing somebody else to do something new, you know, create a new value. McLoach, how, how does that how do we close that gap? How do we take what Matt is saying and his curiosity in a personal world driven by clients saying, hey, if you can use it, be more efficient to, all right, I'm going to create a use case that actually or a realistic scenario that says, here's how you can do it. And here's a responsible way of using this technology that is now available. Look, I would start with saying um, that I think it is new. So I've been dealing with AI for eight, eight, nine years, like really seriously on um, on an everyday basis. And, um, you know, ChatGPT, uh, GPT 3.5 was something that went beyond all expectations. A lot of people claims, uh, there's a claim that, you know, they expected something like this, but the reality is that not even Sal Altman before the launch expected that it would be as good as, as it was actually. So um, it is a big surprise and it's um, it's even a little bit more than I think the iPhone moment of AI, because this is what people say that this is the iPhone moment. This was the first time November 30th when, when it came out, when everybody saw that what, what, what really AI is capable of. In my opinion, it is, it is, it is better because the, the, the whole thing, is is really about this is a this is a linguistic interface and this is like the most important thing to to say about you know ChatGPT it is a linguistic interface but it can communicate so well it almost never makes any grammatical mistakes it can talk about anything i mean just this pure fact you would not expect a couple of years ago none of the models you came across i tested but, the, but, the, but I want I want to jump in real quick because you said it can talk about anything, but its knowledge base is not current. It is not. It's not because it's not about knowledge base. It's not even not even even current. I think it can differentiate. I think we can say it can differentiate uh, true and false because it's unimportant from from the perspective of a language model. It was trained to talk. It was trained to form an argument to talk with the ability to talk about anything. But 
I mean, our mentality is is really focused on an AI that is built on a rule based system, which is going to tell you knowledge. That's the expectation. It is smarter than me, but it's not smarter than you. This one is actually talking. It is. It has the capability of talking better than you. And that's a different thing. It can differentiate in between, it can differentiate between true and false. So even if you prompt it very well, I tried, I I I um I developed a prompt engineering tool for lawyers uh, that, that is available for Android devices. It's free, you can download it, its name, it's Mickey Bot. So I'm not, you know, it's not, it's really free. So it's um there is no hidden in-app purchasing or anything. I just want to show that even with a prompt engineering tool, you can uh you can get a way better result out of the system. But, but the reality is, even if you prompt it, please do not make any mistake. Please don't come up with something that you know know of. If, unless you're super certain, don't say it is. It's not gonna be able to do it. Because right. it, it is a statistical model, and it, what it does, it tries to say the most probable next word in a sentence with a temperature and with a, with an attention to a couple of words. I don't want to go into the details there. You know, I know a lot about how it, it is, how I, I, actually it works. But um, what I can say is this is this model can only work if you you provide the content. So if you provide a document and, and, and you could provide another document and say that in the context of this document, review this document, then it will be really superb. I mean, obviously, you, re, you will have to use some factorization, a lot of things, word embeddings, embeddings, a um, couple of things we're testing in a moment. But from even preliminary testing, I can say that if you use another, if you combine with another model, and you provide the content, then it's then it's a superb engine. But the problem is that people don't understand how these models work, and this is really um, what this was really made and developed as a chatbot. You know, for you to talk and have a good conversation. It's really a show off of of AI's capability, and it's nothing but a show off. If you try, if you really want to use it for knowledge centric systems like you know law is not only a complex system but is so much centered around knowledge it is a domain that is focused on you know knowledge 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 so it's not going to know it so unless you provide the content it's not going to be able to produce a good result therefore the way to cope with this challenge for lawyers is providing basically providing the content to to GPT. Those models that are rule based are way better in most of the cases, way better in dealing with legal cases. But they don't have the capability to communicate because what they can do is differentiate, you know, one contract from another or extract the the change of control clause from a really really long document. But that's a rule based system. What we're talking about is a is a linguistic model, you know, a large language model, um, which is built on a statistical uh, uh, algorithm. So basically, it can, this one can communicate. This one is good in um, is good in um, you know somehow finding uh, the right um, finding the right way in in the maze of law. If you combine the two things, then you will end up having a perfect legal AI, but we don't have it yet. So I was just going to say, but I, I like your, I really like your distinction though, because, and going with knowledge versus almost conversational. It, it, and, and we said that today was going to be conversational to that end, but the, but the knowledge base of saying, I need to know specifics, which it wraps the legal field in a, in, in a great, you know, presentation because you have to be very specific but there are use cases where having a conversation to understand or, as you put it, to give it information to potentially summarize, to be able to understand what happened in a given fact scenario and maybe factors that could come into it. There are use cases that could be there. Matt, what are some of the ones that you're starting to see the clients or maybe even the corporate start to push on in the sense of challenging the legal field to to explore? Because I, I haven't heard anybody saying you have to use it. I've heard people encouraging the exploration of the use cases. Yeah, um, I, I think to be blunt, people are 
still somewhat tentative in terms of how to use it and the, the best use cases. Uh, I think to a certain degree, there is a I mean, there's a, a period of trial and testing, which is is somewhat unusual for, for for law firms and for lawyers because we we don't like to fail. But I, I think we we take this on the chin that it's okay to to, to experiment and to trial. But where where I'm seeing particular um, uh, appetite, if you will, is I, I imagine if you've got any kind of transaction or dispute, whether it's uh, business law or consumer law, and you've broken that down into a process because, let's be honest, large elements of what we do is process. If if you're using words like analyze or review or summarize or draft to describe whatever the task is, that seems to be where people are focusing their efforts and 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 training the 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 AI solution to to assist with. Uh, and that's that's a logical sort of next step of what they've they've been doing previously. So there there are some obvious areas again that have, have really paved the way in terms of AI being a bigger, quicker search tool. So your, your corporate DD, for instance, or your disclosure, regulatory filings, things of that nature. But, but an interesting example that you know, Miklos and I are, are both sort of very familiar with is if you take the, the landscape and the world of regulatory compliance. So picture you're a global multinational organization with operations around the world, tens of thousands of employees subject to countless um, and ever changing uh, rules and regulations around the world. How on earth do you keep on top of that? And, and you know, clearly one of the the ways that you can do that is is lean on external advisors, lean on knowledge developed elsewhere to help you guide through this this maze. Um, and it, it strikes me this kind of uh, ability to sort of lean on the current. You know, evolution of AI to help assist and actually bring clarity to this and more than that, make sort of sectoral recommendations that go beyond just a generic, if you're an employer in South Africa, you have to do this and make it specific to if you're oil and gas sector or, you know, company in South Africa, from an employment perspective, this is what you should be doing. It, it strikes me that that's, that's a, a, a terrific opportunity um of other cases that I, I know are, are particularly live in the uk at the moment but on the consumer side things like residential conveyancing uh will writing a, 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 anything that can really sort of bluntly help fix broken processes um, and i think a lot of time and effort being invested in looking at how Things like um, you know, AI and other tech solutions could address that. I, I think the final one, though, which is perhaps a not good use case. Um, I, I does it come with come warning with, signs? <laughs> uh, yeah, this, the, the klaxon goes off now, and um, yeah, pe people turn away. But I have a strong suspicion that it will be used as a tool in the ongoing uh, warfare in terms of e-billing. So over the years, we've seen this sort of shifting dynamic between corporates with big legal spend and their, their private practice law firms and in-house is developing outside council guidelines and embedding these within systems and then law firms developing approaches to deal with it. Um, I, I, I almost expect to see a whole wave of uh, artificial intelligence actually waging the war instead of people so that um you know somebody somewhere is winning this war but uh, actually misses the fact that we should all be fixing our fees but that's perhaps a podcast for a different time i i do believe so i do believe so i i remember back when i was at the firm uh at a firm and the time entries were very rule-based scrutinized to where if you had over 0.3 on a, on a line entry that said call, it had to say extended call and it had to have at least three names. Otherwise, it get re auto rejected. And, and you start learning these rules and you start figuring out ways to 
better articulate your time entry, which really didn't substantively t- change anything except for it took a little bit of ingenuity to get past the the rule engines, if you will. So I, I absolutely can see that coming into play in the, in the world of fee analysis and, and all that. But I think going back to what you said, which is anywhere that says analyze or summarize is a great area for the use of technology. And, and I don't think it is necessarily eliminating what what we're doing, but rather maybe giving us a jump start, giving us the ability to say, I don't, I don't have to go read all million or understand it or prepare the summary. If I can get a jump start on a summer summarization of, of a scenario, because I've provided it the knowledge that McLoche talks about, right. I've given it the information and the insights that helps me become more efficient. Cause I can, I, I can start to see, you know, the forest amongst the trees, if you will. Um, but McLoche, what, you know, br- round this out with what you would recommend as the the pivotal or the best application of this type of technology to consider. Look, AI is so unfair because it kind of shows where you are in terms of digitalization. Um, yes. I keep telling to my clients and whomever I'm talking to is that, you know, automation is really the last, the last step in a process rather than the first one. Everyone oh. expects that you have you know, this secret sauce, call it AI, and you just deploy it to your processes, it's going to fly and it's going to make you so efficient and so productive and we're going to be making so much money. It's not going to be like that. Not at all. It is really the, whoever can now deploy AI very well are those ones who are far ahead of the process in terms of digitalization. They already, they have been probably most, I would say they have been, gathering data in a very structured way for like at least a decade. They have already automated a lot of processes. They think that legal is in fact, you know, is a work stream. They, and, and everything is almost like a project. They, they use legal project management. They have been using it probably for five years. And this is like the best candidate for AI. If you lack any of these things, you're not going to be able to use AI too extensively, only for those gaps, what Matt described. And I, yeah, yeah, I agree for wills and testimonies, you know, AI is going to be really easy to use, even for e-discovery from time to time. Yeah, but there are solutions available which are much better than, than, than GPT for e-discovery. Oh, yeah. But the reality is that you have to that you have to invest a lot of time and effort into the whole process of us of digitalization. But this is not even about digitalization. It's like the making your legal business feeling like um, a venture and not like, I don't know, um, some sort of guilt-based firm from the 19th century. Um, you really have to think like in thinking processes in design and workflows and, and work streams and, and profit and loss. And, and, and most probably you're the guy who's running the show should not be even a lawyer. Have you seen a good company, like a good hospital being run by a doctor or a good theater run by an actor? I have not. I mean, most of those ones failed. I mean, in my opinion, law firms should be managed by non-lawyers, actual business people who understand, you know, numbers. They think not in Word documents, but in Excel sheets. And we we have to start using Excel sheets. This is where it starts. No, I love it. A great client of mine uh, who is an in-house general counsel for an oil and gas company, actually, uh, he, he said, everybody forgets that litigation is a business problem stuck in the courtroom. And if we think of if we think of the practice of law in a business mindset, which I think goes back to Matt, what you you did on, during the introduction, which is talk about processes, change management, culture, and everything else, it's really a business, and we we tend to forget about that amongst the motions and the discovery practices and everything else. But we've got to understand and get back to the fact that it's a business, which goes to your point, uh, McLoche, that it is it, you have to be mature in those processes. Otherwise, you can put all the technology you want on top of it. It's not going to really benefit you as much as starting at the foundation of what you need to build to be able to take advantage of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Just, just to add something there, Hunter, as, as well. Um, 
I, I, I see that one of the great impediments at the moment, which actually would be addressed by this this commercialization that we're talking about, is is the, this sort of ongoing fear that if if AI or technology more generally is as successful as it could be, perhaps as we would like it to be, it's going to free up tremendous amounts of time. Um, if you're an in-house team, you go tremendous. That's great. We've got any number of other things that we, we could be getting on with. But from a law firm perspective, the, there is that element of if we've always generated revenue based on time and now we're selling less of it, there's an obvious knock on effect there to our, our revenue. So how, how are we going to address that? Um, and yeah, frankly, back to the point about greater pricing confidence and fixing fees, different ways of billing for work or invoicing as clients call it. Um, I, I think this is what we're going to see more of. And to, to Miklos's point about who will succeed here, I think it will be those firms who are most and professionalized and commercialized in this way who recognize that actually the the old the old model of working the old way of charging clients is is frankly broken and, and doesn't doesn't meet current purposes oh matt we we could have a whole nother podcast on fee schedules <laughs> and afas and, and the need to get back to value-based billing as opposed to just unit-based billing um you know you don't pay the mechanic you know, ten thousand dollars for his ten minutes of time. It's it's you know the ten dollars for the wrench and the nine thousand nine hundred ninety dollars to know where to use the wrench. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot there, and I think that that's where I view the technology as allowing us as an enabler, if you will, uh, to be able to get back to more value centric uh, billing practices and, and conveying that. Because I think that if you have the expertise and you have the maturity and the processes and you can leverage the technology, you can achieve some exceptional results for clients and still have a life outside of work. I mean, we, we, we can go as far as that, right? Like we can leverage the technology for better results. And I think that if we can get there, now we're truly optimizing the use case. McLoach, you talked about, you know, you can have, if you're not built on good processes and a foundation that you won't, you won't actually get the benefits. Yeah. At the same time, if you see, I mean, when I started my career 25 years ago in London, I got paid for telling clients um, what the law says. Who gets paid now for something like this? No one. Um, I mean, life has changed. Legal practice has changed. We have to provide way more than that. And I think AI is going to be yet another factor is going, which is going to enforce us to, to do something even more. So yeah, it will, you know, um, we will save some time on using AI. Like you don't have to do the first draft because the, the AI is going to be able to do it. But, you know, maybe it will be able to replace your paralegal, your intern. If it's really good, then sometimes even your trainee, but it's not going to be able to talk to your client. And that's, right. um, I, think, I think the personal relationship and um, that that part, which is this magical personal, I don't know, the chemistry part, whatever you have with your client is that you're, you, you kind of understand, even, even, even though you may not have a very, the personal relationship, he, he either trusts you or relies on your advice because he thinks that you're a good person or a bad person, but a very professional one. Doesn't really matter. There's got to be a personal factor, and I think this this matters a lot because I think computers are just computers. They're really good in mimicking us, but they're not us. And even though they're superb in mimicking your wife. From a lot of uh, from a lot of conversation you might have with her, it's not going to be the same thing because it can't really come up with new ideas. Whatever creativity it has, it's really the it's some sort of replication of historical data. So what I'm trying to say with this, I think this personal factor in providing any kind of you know professional services will be will have a higher value. So there will be a much more, even more focus on 
you have a good relationship with your client. You have to understand the more about the operation of your client in order for you to, to give a better advice. And you have to be more convincing, something that goes beyond the capabilities of computers. Yeah, computers are good in drafting, so it's going to be gone. I mean, 20 years from now, you're not going to be making money on, on providing drafts. It's going to be generated by computers, in my opinion. At the same time, it will not be able to argue um, instead of you, you will have to do that. It, you, it, it will not be able to convince your client to do or this or that. You will have to provide more complex advice. So you will have more time to learn and prepare yourself for a meeting. But the expectation is going to be that you're providing something that only you as a, as a trusted advisor can, can provide. So it actually raises, again, the barrier. It's we're going up and up and up. This is what is going on. It has been going on in the last two, three, four decades. Well, I, I think that brings us all the way back to the beginning when we started talking about what is intelligence and why we call it artificial because it's coming from a non-human. So uh, with, with that, I want to thank uh, Matt and Miklos uh, for joining us today. And of course, our listeners, if you'd like to learn more about IDS or subscribe, you can visit us at IDSINC.com or wherever you normally get your podcast. Gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've already got like five new topics in mind uh, that we can uh, rekindle the conversation here in a couple of weeks, but uh, really appreciate your time and everybody uh, to join us. Thank you very much. You're